top alcohol dragster and top alcohol funny car. Two of the quickest and fastest categories in NHRA drag racing. One step down from the professional ranks, they're called the pro sportsman categories in NHRA. The pro describes the level of competition and the commitment it takes to run at this level. The sportsman describes the blue collar racers at the heart of the category and the camaraderie of all the racers who make up the top alcohol classes. Get ready to take a look behind the scenes at the blood, sweat, and effort it takes to race at this level. This is Top Alcoholic. On this episode of Top Alcohol, and we're at the 60th Annual Lucas Oil Winter Nationals presented by Protect the Harvest, and we'll be following Chris Dimke in Top Alcohol Dragster and Doug Gordon in Top Alcohol Funny Car. This episode brought to you by PSI Superchargers. Chris Dimke is the driver of the Madden Racing Top Alcohol Dragster and has been with the team since its inception. After fighting issues with the car not wanting to go straight at the last few events of the 2019 season, the team made the decision to have a new front half of the chassis put on over the offseason. Having just got the car two weeks before their hometown race here at the Winter Nationals, the team has been in thrash mode just to make it to the racetrack. The first qualifying session will be the first run on this new front half of the chassis. Chris Dempke, I'm driver of the Peenwright Boost Performance Products Top Alcohol Dragster. I've been with this team since its inception in 1991. Started driving in 2002, so this, that makes this, what, my 18th year? I Sometimes I still feel like a rookie, but sometimes I realize I'm kind of an old hat at it. But uh, being this is the first race of the season, uh, in a fresh car with a uh, you know, new body, new front half, and so forth, Always gets the butterflies going, but uh, you know I know how to get through it all, and uh, excited to be driving this car and uh, see how this season goes. So, uh, name's Kevin Watson. I'm uh, I guess you consider me like assistant crew chief uh, slash tuner. Um, always hard to hear that about myself, considering I was a car chief for so long and it's starting my 17th season with this team. So, uh, been around a long time, seen a lot of stuff, blown a lot of things up. Won a lot of races, so. Um, yeah, anyway, so here we are, new pipe, shaking this thing down, see how we do. Hi, my name is Jerry Mattern. I, I help run the team. I um, started in 1992, and we, I've had several drivers. I had Frank Bedrick on, I had Darren Nicholson. Uh, we've, um, we won the championship, I think the 14, was it? I don't remember for sure, but, um, We've been doing it for a long time, and it's fun. I enjoy the class. I don't really like day fuel cars. I think we should be all blown. Yeah, I really like the blown alcohol combination. I like the people we meet. Um, it's just it, it's just a fun class. Doug Gordon is a second-generation racer, following in his father Mike's footsteps behind the wheel of the Gordon family top alcohol funny car. The team suffered a major setback at the end of the 2019 season, suffering a horrendous crash at the Fall Vegas event. The team decided to partner up with two-time world champ Johnny Lindbergh, who just recently entered the chassis building business to put together a car for the 2020 season. The team is also debuting new major sponsor, Beta Motorcycles, for this season as well. Doug Gordon, number five in the world a year ago. But he is the number one qualifier, 42.6 to a 42.9. I have a feeling both of these drivers and their team's gonna try to step on it. Well, obviously the key is, will it be smooth to the 300 foot mark? That's the key here. Doug Gordon towards the right side wall, keeps the hammer down, tags the wall, across the track, left side, on his lid, Doug Gordon sliding, body comes off, parachutes out like Raymond Beetle years ago, wow, Doug Gordon. Dennis Taylor, that car made a move towards the right side wall, Doug trying to keep it off the wall, went across the track, and the safety safari is rolling. And there he is, Doug Gordon, standing next to his, with the remaining chassis that is together and disgusted. You can see Doug Gordon, as a safety safari, arrives on the, sh on the scene, gloves off. Hans coming off. 
Safety Safari speaking with him. He is obviously very disappointed. Fire jacket coming off. Doug Gordon, a very experienced race car driver. You see the remainder of the body, the top of the screen. The wrecked hulk of a chassis. Here comes the helmet off. There's Doug Gordon. And you can see he is just disgusted. Hands on his head. He knows. Ugh. The turn. Terrible that, moment. That's the first time in uh, probably close to 20 years that Doug's been driving alcohol funny cars that he's ever flipped one over and put it on his lid. Check out Sunoco Vision. Here we go. Instant replay. Doug Gordon made a quick move right there to the right side, and then it dances over again, and that's he's off the throttle and then right across the track on his lid. There the body comes off. And he's back on four wheels. My goodness, Dennis Taylor. You know, for as spectacular as that was, that thing was actually made some a pretty soft landing down there, you know, on those rear tires. Here and we see it again from the top end view. All the way down track. Bellamere going to be off the throttle pretty much right away. And Doug Gordon. A quick pedal. Off into the marbles, and they just don't want to steer that well out there in the marbles. Body comes off, parachutes out. And you can see Doug in the cockpit of the race car and simply amazing. Comes to a stop. You can see right into Doug's eyes looking around the experience that man just had. I'm Doug Gordon, driver of the Beta Motorcycles Top Alcohol Funny Car. I've been driving uh, alcohol funny cars since 1993. I got my license when I was 18 years old and uh, been driving ever since. Uh, we've uh, won nine national events and I believe 26 regional races and been fortunate enough to win four Division 7 championships. We've uh, got a new major sponsor this year with Beta Motorcycles as well as having uh, Lucas Oil on board again this year and it's gonna be fun to drive a red alcohol funny car. I'm very fortunate to be able to race with my whole family. My parents, uh, they own the alcohol funny car. My dad used to drive in the, uh, he ran, raced sand drag racing and then uh, changed over to the alcohol cars in I believe it was 1986. Uh, at that time I was just doing log books on the car and then I moved up to building engines and I was always part of the team and uh, we, I believe it was the early 90s, the economy was kind of down, and we thought maybe we're only gonna get to race one more year. So dad gave me the shot to get licensed and said, hey, we're gonna give you a shot at driving for a year since you've loved the sport so much. And we drove that first year. I did good enough, the economy kind of turned back around, and next thing you know, we're still out here doing it. But I get to do it with my family. My wife gets to come out to some of the races, the kids come out to a lot of the races. We've even started doing uh, junior drag racing and got them very involved in it, very good at it, and uh, we've turned this racing thing into about a 30 to 32 weekend year thing for the Gordon family. My name's Mike Gordon, and I'm the owner of the Beta Motorsports, uh, actually Beta Motorcycles, not Motorsports, Top Alcohol Funny Car, Doug Gordon drives, my son. We've been doing this for a long time, and uh, this is probably the best we've been at it in my whole career. Pretty competitive right now, and uh, it's nice to be out here with Beta and my family, and uh, having fun and going fast. Yeah, I started driving this thing myself uh, many moons ago. Drove it for about eight years, and uh, Doug uh, helped me on it from the time he was like five years old. When he got to be 19, I let him uh, get in. I told him he'd drive one year, and then I was going to quit. And uh, after he drove for a year, he did so much better than I ever did. So here we are, whatever, 20-some years later, we're still out here doing it. Yeah. I'm Macy Gordon. I'm Maddie Gordon. And we both drive Junior Dragsters and Junior Comps in the NHRA Division 7 Series. Um, we've been doing this for about six to seven years now, and it's been really fun doing it with our family and growing up around the sport. Yeah, Papa and Dad and my mom really taught me a lot. Like, racing really kind of gave us and send him to do really good in school and in life in general. And racing's really taught us like just great life skills that will carry with us forever. Yeah, we hope to do this a lot longer and 
hope to be around racing. And at an NHRA national event, the top alcohol categories normally get three qualifying sessions. The quickest 16 cars get to make the field. A single elimination bracket will determine the winner, and the quicker car from qualifying or the previous round gets to pick their lane. That's called lane choice. Yeah, so we're here. Uh, first, for, first round of qualifying at the Winter Nationals 2020. Can't say I'm not nervous. You always get a little butterflies first run, run down the track. Uh, after the off season and of course we don't have a new car but we've got a car with a new front half and a new body and of course we're going through some teething problems getting all that dialed in we just got the car back from Lucas Oil who uh, did this front half for us and uh, just got it back last week so we're rushed for time it's you know working through all the little bugs but uh, I think we might have it sorted out get the car from A to B and see if we can put a number on the board so yeah I was talking about how you know we went from a cable car to what I would probably call this as a strut uh, car. And uh, basically what that is, is it's a way to uh, to load the chassis. Um, before the old car, the old chassis, we used a cable that went from a, a high point to a low point, back to a high point, somewhere in the middle of the chassis. And you could tune that, the, the chassis, by tightening or loosening these cables. And it was a way to preload one side or, you know, um, it's older technology and they've come a long way as far as, uh, uh, um, what they've changed so now we've they've, we've gone to what's called i would call it a strut i don't know exactly what they call it more of a turnbuckle style where we've got diagonal turnbuckles between bays that are adjustable so it's a it's the same way to skin a cat it's just this way seems to make the the, the, the chassis itself a lot more rigid um so and from what i understand and talking to everybody it's supposed to make them last longer which is always a bonus you know i mean um, as much runs, as, mu as many runs as we make, as much as we race, we have a tendency to wear these things out. So if we can get a little bit more longevity out of them, then, then it's all to our benefit. The 60th annual Lucas Oil Winter Nationals kicked off the 2020 season for the top alcohol cars with two qualifying sessions scheduled for Thursday. Unfortunately, due to technical issues beyond NHRA's control, there is no feed footage from those runs on Thursday. We were, however, able to get our own cameras rolling for the second qualifying session. Despite being nervous about making his first run on the new front half, Chris Dinkley went straight and true down the racetrack, recording a very solid 528 with a 9 at 269 miles an hour that ended up putting him fourth after the first qualifying session. After the first qualifying session, it was last year's winner, Sean Cowie, who rocketed to the top of the pack with a 518 at 280 miles an hour. Number two was Garrett Bateman with a 525. Former world champ Joey Severance, number three to 526, and Chris Dempke, number four to 528. So we're ready for uh, Q1 here at Pomona. This is a uh, you know, pretty big deal. We got the Johnny Lindbergh funny car for the first time um, you know, at a real race. We tested at Vegas you know, recently, and it uh, went, went pretty well. But um, I got to gain some, gain some nerves back after that bad deal at Vegas and uh, kind of a little bit of bad driving. Um, you know, at Vegas again. So, but we're looking forward to it. If everything goes right, uh, I think it's got capabilities of running in the 40s, which uh, I think will be good for the for the situation. So, we're going to give her our go. Definitely going to be some getting used to. Uh, we're, I've been driving a Hadman car for all these years, and with the Hadman car, I took a did a lot of steering in the car to get it to move around to where I want it to be. With this car, I'm finding that it takes very little steering to do a lot of movement. So. It's gonna be, I've been driving 25 years, so it's gonna take me some training to try to get myself to just do a little bit of this as opposed to a lot of that and not get not get ourselves in trouble. But uh, something we'll overcome and um, I'm, I'm excited to get out there. Unlike Demke, Gordon had the benefit of making some test laps in Vegas and it paid off as Doug Gordon took his new car to a 544 at 269 miles an hour, putting him number one after the first qualifying session. Doug Gordon's 544 at 269 miles an hour put him on the top of the pack after the first qualifying session, while last year's World Finals winner Shane Westerfield was in second with a 547 at 270 miles an hour. Brian Howe was number three with a 559 at 259 miles an hour. The rest of the field had problems and struggled getting down the racetrack in the first session. Pretty happy, actually. The car went down straight as an arrow. Um, you know, the run was pretty respectable, so... You know, I mean, it, we, we kind of drove through the clutch and yeah. had a couple other mishaps, but all in all, pretty pleased with what it did. A um, mile an hour was off a little bit. 
Well, the b- bottom pulley came off at five seconds into the run, <laughs> yeah, so, so essentially it was coasting across the finish line at, right. you know, five, what around 528 at 269. We're, 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 okay, we're very pleased with that, you know. Not bad for out of the box shot with new pipes. So. Well, holding that fresh front end, you have a different front end than we're used to. Some other chassis changes. I'm not going to go details, but we did some other no, stuff, we're pleased though. with it. Yeah. I'm not going down the track and I'm thinking, man, this is so different. I can't wait to tell them about it. I can't remember what was different. <laughs> so, uh, now what? Enjoying his ride too I much. I was scared. Is what I'm all Put it that way. Just plain and simple. Scaredy driver says they're not scared. Only lying to himself. So, <laughs> but whatever. You know, first, like I said earlier, first run down the track after a, a winter off and a uh, new chassis and so forth. Butterflies are oh, big yeah. time on oh, that. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I mean, I'm there, sure for you guys. There, as well. There's, there's a, there's a lot of that, that nervousness happening. Yeah. But you know, that, that just kind of set everything at ease. And here we go. Yeah. So. Now we can get it all licked together and drag it back up and see what it'll do again. <laughs> well, here we are after Q1. That was a great pass, you know, going to 44. The first, first run at a real racetrack in the Johnny Lindbergh car is, uh, was really, really stout. Uh, we did some adjustments to the uh, front end right as we got ready to roll the car up to the starting line, and uh, the whole thing felt a lot better. So right now I feel more comfortable driving the car, which is a big thing, you know, that was getting the driver confidence is was low and getting building that up is going to be a big thing um, so we're pretty we're pretty stoked right now uh, put beta motorcycles at the top Lucas oil uh, what we're going to try to do I think this time just try to go out there and do that again you know I think if we can run some you know mid to low 40s run after run after run we should be uh, should be a good contender uh, going into race day track is probably going to cool down a little bit knowing that it's going to be near dusk or whatever when we run so I think that we might even be able to go a little bit faster, but uh, we're just not going to try to make any big moves one way or another. Second qualifying session. Chris Dempke will be paired up with former Lucas Oil World Champ Wayne Shields in an injected nitro car. Typically, the injected nitro car will start up on alcohol first and build speed in the engine before switching over to nitro. At that point, where they tell their counterparts if they're a blown car, they're ready to go to nitro, and it's usually when the blown car fires up just like Dempke did right there. As Dempke pulls forward and gets ready for the burnout, he's going to bring that engine up between seven and 8,000 RPM and put some heat on the tires, put some rubber on the racetrack being careful not to have any more clutch wear than possible. Good clean burnout right there. Dempke made a good run in that first session with a 528 on that new front half. Kind of top fuel style front half from Morgan Lucas Racing Fabrication. Team really thrashing to get it out here. The team's home race. Dempke out of Tijunga, California. There's one here before. Step up here in the second qualifying session. Wayne Shields is a very capable player with his injected nitro machine car capable of going well into the 520s as well. See Chris Dempke dip into the five teens as well. Sean Cowie number, currently the number one qualifier for a 518, so it's gonna take that to go to the top of the pack. Under Kevin Watson. Pull him into the beans. Let's see what he has right here. Sun setting over Auto Club Raceway here in Pomona. Blown machine, Chris Dempke will bring the engine up somewhere around six to seven thousand RPM on the starting line. 
make two shifts going down track to over 10,000 RPM. Whenever we see one of these blown cars running a fuel cars, the classic case study of high RPM horsepower versus brute torque. Empty brings the engine RPMs up, creeps into the beams, shield stages at idle. Dimke is off, rockets to a great 60 foot time, but engine trouble down track, burst panel is expiring, and slows to a 552 at 198 miles an hour. In the second qualifying session, many of the top teams struggled to get down the racetrack here at Auto Club Raceway in Pomona. Sean Cowie stayed on top of the pack with his 518 from the first session. Garrett Bateman second, Severance third, Dimke fourth, Johnny Otten fifth, and James Stevens sixth. So, uh... Yeah, last night was kind of interesting as far as how things turned out. Car ran really good numbers early, so we were kind of excited about that. And then uh, about half track on, we saw some fire and brimstone, which is never a good thing. And I'm sure he can allude a little bit more about that. Uh, it was probably got a little hot in the seat for him. So. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it launched hard, and uh, I'm really loving this new chassis. Uh, for all my time driving, I've always driven cable cars, and... I think Kevin talked about that cable versus what he's calling a strut car. Strut car. This car is much stiffer on the front, but man, it feels solid and wants to go straight. Yeah. And uh, I, 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 Always I, the bonus. After my first run down the track, I, I remember going down the track thinking, I can't wait to tell him about this car being different. But when I got out, I couldn't remember what it was I wanted to tell him. So after the second run, I was more aware, more thinking about it. And uh, yeah, this thing just feels solid. And uh, it wants to go where you point it. I don't feel like I'm behind the car, if, if you know what that means. But anyway, I'm loving the, the, this new for some chassis. It seems to be working good. It pulled off a great 60 foot time last night. Best it's uh, ever had. Yeah, yeah. This car's it, never it, run out sub, sub nine. 9. 7.9, 8.97, uh, which is really good. You know, it's only two runs on the car. Still got, got to work on it and so forth, but it's showing good signs. However, you know, I plugged it into second was motoring and pulling hard and suddenly it wasn't <laughs> it yeah. made kind of an odd sound yep. um i immediately shut it off pulled over to the side I was a little late on the shoots but uh you know as it turned out it uh, torched ahead yeah we did bad, the, we so, did the uh, autopsy on it this morning a little bit and uh basically what we found is that uh it was chicken or the egg either the the valve let go or the lifter let go one of two and what 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 subsequently happens is that it shuts that exhaust valve off over boosting one side of the motor and then at that point, yeah, it, it's going to find its way out somewhere, and it usually goes right out the side of the block in the yeah. head and makes a big mess. And So anyway, needless to say, we had to put another motor in the car for today. Uh, but we're going to do a rinse and repeat, leave it where it is. Uh, Want to see if it's going to go out. Hey, all, the, all the incrementals from yesterday, it was going to be a really good run. Yeah. So we want to see if we can actually leg it out the back and get that number. And uh, if it does, then we're on to something. We have a tunable race car. So, um, you know, it'll be fun. We'll see how it does. Doug Gordon gets ready to go here in the second qualifying session. Comes into the session number one at a 544 in that first qualifying session. Obviously, this new Johnny Lindbergh chassis doing very well in its first race, first outing here at the Winter Nationals. Sporting new sponsorship from Beta Motorcycles. Doug, as a driver, gets ready to go, cinches down on those belts, and he fires up the car. Last chance to kind of go over your thoughts and get ready for the run as the team lowers the body. Top alcohol funny board. You'll burn out anywhere from seven to eight thousand RPM. Be very careful not to wear the clutch any more than necessary. It was one of the funnest parts of driving a top alcohol funny car. Doing that long burnout. Kind of rock the car forward. Reversers in these cars. You basically have to get the gears lined up to be able to go back into reverse. Lift that hatch up to get some of the smoke out of the cockpit. Pick up the directions of your crew member out front and get lined up just where the crew wants you. Perfect spot on the starting line. Remember right here, the fans at the top of that skate hatch to get some of that smoke out of the cockpit. The driver making sure car is back in low gear to do the burnouts in high gear. Those shifters on the steering wheel are the shifters. Two shifts going down the racetrack, three-speed transmission. Everything the alcohol funny car will bring the starting line revs up to 
anywhere from seven to 8,000 RPM and make two shifts going down the racetrack at over 10,000 RPM. Ford pumps the brakes, brings the engine up. We're fixing to go. Lights the bottom bulb. Sets him back, look like it's on another good pass, clean pass, making the shifts going down the racetrack, throwing the chutes. Doug Gordon runs another great run, a 5.43. As hard as these top alcohol funny cars are to drive, the ride is not over at the finish line as the car often will buck and bang and jump all around as you try to get it slowed down. And Pomona Raceway is one of the shortest tracks on the circuit, so it's definitely an important task to get that car slowed down. Another good run for Doug Gordon, and that'll keep him on top of the pack. Doug Gordon's 5.43 with a 2 at 268 miles an hour would keep him in the number one spot after the second session, while Shane Westerfield stepped up to a 5.43 to be right there behind him in number two. Number three is Ulfley Andrews, who found the 5.40s with a 5.45, as did Brian Howe with a 5.49 to be number fourth. Aaron Roshan in fifth with a 5.54. Terry Ruckman, another 5.54, is in sixth. Mike Dushkonian is seventh with a 5.80, as several cars still struggle to get down the Pomona racetrack. PSI Superchargers, mind-blowing performance since 1988. Manufacturer of championship-winning screw and root superchargers. Also components like mag drives, burst panels, and studs. Find out more at PSISuperchargers.com. After two qualifying sessions on Thursday, the top alcohol cars are scheduled to have their final qualifying session Friday evening. We're getting ready for Q3 coming up here tonight. And uh, the track conditions are probably going to be pretty good. The fuel cars are on the track today, so we anticipate some good track conditions. We're anticipating it being pretty cool and pretty mean like it was last night. Last night, we actually probably should have ran a 41, something like that. The, uh, when it shifted into second gear, it opened up the burst panel on the, on the front of the manifold and dropped about four pounds of boost from what we had on the previous run. So that was... You know, we don't know exactly what it was going to do, but it was. we think maybe it had potential of probably running another couple hundreds uh, quicker. So looking at the early numbers, I mean, we think 41, maybe 42. But So I think we're going to go out there again with the same type of tune-up, see if we can run a, you know, a 40 to a 42. You know, we might might even get after a little bit more with the, with the fuel guys being on the track. So on that Q2 qualifier, we still qualified number two or number one with that 543. But uh, we have burst panels in the, in the front of the motor. Um, we've got one here, and there's actually one in the back. And they're designed to blow out in the case of a um, banging the blower, they call it, but an explosion that comes up inside the manifold, the fire that comes up inside the manifold. So this is what a, this is what a burst panel looks like. It's a thin piece of uh, metal with, with uh, it's lightened in some areas, so it's designed to open up under pressure. Well, on that run, we ended up with a burst panel that looked like this. So as you can see, there's an opening inside of it that was blowing air out the opening as opposed to pressurizing the cylinders, we were pressurizing the atmosphere, which, you know, lost us some ET. We don't know exactly how much, but we're hoping it was quite a bit. So hopefully if we keep a first panel looks like this in it for the whole Q3, maybe we'll see some good numbers. Final two funny cars, Shane Westerfield and Doug Gordon rolling up here. Doug in that brand new car, and you mentioned that this car is unique in one very special factor, and that is the chassis builder on this car. This is the first ever. I mean, it's got like the number one stamp on it. This is, this is chassis number 001 from Johnny Lindbergh Motorsports. Johnny built this car himself in his shop in Brownsburg, Indiana. Now, the two of these cars, Shane Westerfield and Doug Gordon, are just playing with the rest of the guys, as we saw yesterday afternoon. How about a 543 with a six and a 543 with a two, side by side, yesterday, about this time? Yeah, and you're talking about this is chassis number 001, currently qualified number one, and for Johnny Lindbergh, that's gotta be one of those puff your chest out type things like, hey, look what I have accomplished already. So with Doug Gordon here on the right side, Shane Westerfield on the left, make no bones about it. Westerfield and the guys, they are gunning for that number one spot. They want that spot. Doug Gordon is doing everything he can to keep them from getting it. Well, you know, and the Gordons, they, they think they can run a little bit better. And with the weather that we're seeing here in the conditions right now, I mean, I think it's gonna pick up again. Once again, in set, tree drops, 
Shane Westerfield is out of the throttle early. Doug Gordon goes 547, 269 miles an hour. So it's not an improvement on the 543, but still putting another run in the 540 range. Well, I tell you what, you talk about consistency. That's a bad hot rod. 544, 543, 547. That is amazing for an alcohol funny girl. As the field is now set, it's Doug Gordon in the number one spot with a 543. Shane Westerfield's 543.6 will stay number two. Oak Leander's 545 at number three. Brian Houck, 549 at number four. Jay Payne's 550 moved him up into the number five spot. And we have got cars fired, ready to go. The rest of the field will line up behind him. I am joined now on the microphone by Will Hanna. That top alcohol dot, or excuse me, the inside alcohol.com, and now inside top alcohol. And I'm looking, I'm like starting to jump ahead to the top alcohol and show. Right which, on. That right. is really, really cool, Will. Yeah, it's a cool project. I've been working with the NHRA on to kind of spotlight these uh, top alcohol racers. And Doug Gordon happens to be one of the cars we're following this weekend. Very cool. Very cool. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Oh, we went uh, Q3, we went uh, to the top again for the run. Not as good as what we were hoping for. Honestly, with the conditions and the situation of the run, from last run to this run, we, we anticipated probably, probably I thought a 41, maybe 42. Dad thought, ah, maybe even a 39, because I mean, the conditions were good, but it looks like we were just a little bit too weak and it stuck the tire, which maybe shows us it'll be a little weak all weekend, but it stuck the tire. Wind was a little slower than we thought, 47 on the board, but still the car's going down the track, run after run. Uh, which is, you know, puts us in a good position to come into, into Saturday eliminations. Um, it looks like tomorrow we're going to have um, Hannes Wernhardt first round. Uh, you never know. we got to get down the track and run good. And, uh, you know, if we can do that, we should have a good shot. And uh, if we can get by that round, then we could have a, a bye, I believe, in the second round. So when I say stick in the tire, basically, uh, you know, we like to get a certain amount of tire speed or revolutions uh, uh, to keep the keep the car mo uh, momentum up, and what happens sometimes if the if the tire will grab the track and not rotate, then it tries to blow through the clutch or basically slide the clutch, which is not going to make it go as fast. And once you slide the clutch early, it starts getting the clutch hot, and then it won't want a truck on the on the middle of the run or on the other end. So we only lost a little bit of numbers early due to it, but it ended up showing more loss of VT as the track as, as the run went on and slowed it down some. But still, if we can go to the top of the heap on that run, we're not going to complain. All right. Take the practice swing and then go, all right, I did it or I didn't. Chris Demke and Dwayne Shields will be the next two. Dwayne, who's got that brand new look on the race car, left side of the track, for years was running under the peak banner and has now got muscle milk alongside. It's one of those things where, you know, we went from Doug Gordon racing a green car to a red car, and now Dwayne Shields jumping into a red race car. It's something that, again, muscle memory on our side. We're used to seeing that blue ride out there, and now he's got muscle milk on the side. Good to see them running in here. Absolutely good to see it. New corporate sponsor coming to the class. You know, Dwayne Shields debuted. This is a new car out of the Vegas fall race out there. Went to the winter circle. Now he's got the old war out car compared to Chris Dempke. Got the fresh, <laughs> fresh new pipe, the fresh uh, front half, the new body on that car. Got to tell you, the new car theme is definitely playing out here and doing very well out here in Pomona. Chris Dempke has a new top fuel style front half from Morgan Luke and Ra Morgan Lucas Racing. Run very strong. Was on a probably a high five team run last night, but. Had some engine damage, put out a lot of fire, and a little bit of explosion there. Uh, Got to believe if this team can duplicate that run right here, they should be able to get the low 20s, if not the high teens. Obviously, Dwayne Shields and that Dana Hopewell tuned machine, very capable of going into the 520s and 5 teens as well. Yeah, and you mentioned yesterday, which I thought was very, very interesting, is for them to get it in and get some free stage. We'll talk about it maybe after this run, kind of the difference between the car that Chris Dempke has and that Morgan Lucas Racing versus some of the older cars. Dwayne Shields is out of the throttle. Tris, Chris Demke is running it through, and he will go 523, 277 miles an hour. And Chris Demke and the guys pick up 500 of a second from yesterday. Yeah, he was figuring out how that new car steers right there for sure. He was getting a little bit closer, a little bit closer, a little bit closer. He was getting so close to that center, I got to believe Kevin Watson and the crew down there are probably getting that little bowling ball lean to the right there. Like, come on, back, come, come on back, come on back. Over. A good run there, 523, 277. 
moving all the way up to the number two spot. Despite several teams stepping up in Friday's final qualifying session, Sean Cowie's 5'8 team from the first qualifying session was enough to keep him in the top spot. Garrett Bateman was right there behind him with a 5'18 of his own to be in the number two spot. Chris Dempke stepped up to a 5'23 to earn the number three spot. Joey Severance's 5'26 from the first qualifying session kept him fourth. Johnny Otten's 536 put him in the five spot. James Stevens, 539, number six. And Jerry Cumry rounded out the front half of the field with a 550. In the first round, Sean Cowie will get a bye run. Garrett Bateman will match up with Ron Anderson. Chris Demke with Casey Grizzell. Joey Severance will run Dusty Green. Johnny Otten will run Dwayne Shields. James Stevens will run Mike Austin. And Jerry Cumry will match up with Nick Childers. Went out there, ran really well, car uh, responded. We didn't make any, really any changes from the round before where we hurt the engine, so I just figured let's go rinse, repeat, see what it does. Um, track and, conditions changed. Track conditions yeah, got a lot better. better. They, yeah. they ran a couple of pro sessions before we ran today. So typically what happens is the track gets much tighter, there's better rubber, um, so we probably lost a little bit in the sense that we drove through the clutch a little bit. Didn't have enough clutch weight on the on the fingers, the counterweight. Uh, but it still went right down Broadway. Uh, kind of hiking the front end up there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a it's a pleasure to drive, but yeah, it's it, it's we got to get the car balanced. It's a little light on the nose. That's what we're working That's on right now. Is. It's just working on the weight balance of the car to make sure that we can keep the front end down, and so he has full contact and able to drive the damn thing. You know, it gets a little squirrely out there, so. But other than that, we're, we're pretty pleased. I mean, yeah. it, it hauled ass. <laughs> to run, you know, lay down a 23 on the third run after a new front half and so forth. I think it's, I, we couldn't help for better. Yeah, I, I think that uh, it's pretty good, pretty good step in the right direction anyway. So. Yeah. <laughs> PSI Superchargers, mind-blowing performance since 1988. Manufacturer of championship-winning screw and root superchargers. Also components like mag drives, burst panels, and studs. Find out more at PSISuperchargers.com. Saturday kicks off eliminations for the top alcohol cars with first round scheduled Saturday morning and the second round scheduled for Saturday evening. Unfortunately, there were more technical difficulties with the NHRA feed from Saturday morning, so we don't have the first round of eliminations from them. However, we did have our cameras rolling. Well, uh, getting ready for first round of eliminations at the Little Internationals. Um, yeah, but once again, first race of the year, uh, I think I got it in me. I, I, Kevin's got the car running fairly consistent, and uh, now it's up to me. I'm going to have to do my job. I think he's going to leave the tune-up alone and just see if we can rinse and repeat for this round. Um, no pressure, right? Uh, hopefully, if we can get past first round, second round will be again later this afternoon. I don't want to think too strongly about that. i got to keep focused on this round, do my job, get it A to B as quick as possible, and uh, hopefully turn on the wind light. Demke's first round opponent will be Casey Grissel, after the legendary Jerry Darien. A lot of the prominent professional drivers have got their start behind the wheel of one of Darien's potent A fuel machines. Grissel struggled to get down the track, qualifying. While Chris Demke, the Madden racing team with that new Gordon Lucas top fuel style front half, got down the racetrack every run. 523 in that last qualifying session put him number three. Very stout early numbers. The second qualifying session, wounded an engine down track. Sub 960 foot. Now. Brazil and that Jerry Darian team, a very proven team, ran a lot of consistent 520s at the end of the 2019 season, but struggling here in qualifying. Chris Dempke and that Matter team know they got a tough contender over the other lane despite not getting down the racetrack. Both these teams coming out of the Southern California area. Playing a home game here at the Winter Nationals. Matter of fact, Jerry Darien was the first driver to win an event in the top alcohol dragster category when it was separated out of the pro comp category back in 1981 right here at the Winter Nationals. Dempke and the Madden team only got this car back two weeks ago, and it's been a mad thrash just to make it here to Winter National. 
car started off right where they left off, getting in the 520s. Nipke's been in the 5 teens. Rizzle's been a proven 520 player, but hasn't done it here this weekend. Kicked off the 2020 racing season, round one right here in Pomona. Nipke's gonna bring that engine up some more around 6,500 RPM. Rizzle's gonna leave it at dead idle. Nipke's in, Rizzle's in, and we're off. Purcell with a perfect light. Can Dempke catch him? Doesn't look like it. Very close race there. But it was Casey Grizzle getting the win. A perfect light, putting it with a 529 with a 2 at 268 miles an hour. Chris Dempke was right there with a 530 with a 027 light. But Casey Grizzle, that Jerry Darian team, reached down and pulled a perfect light. Reaching back and getting into the 520s was enough to take the win and go into round two. Chris Dempke's close loss in the first round would signal the end of the weekend for his team here at their home track. However, coming into the event with no testing on their new front half, the team was still pleased with the results. All, uh, you know, poop in the bed. <laughs> come on, I, mean, I mean, it was a good on. race. We Look came up a little short on that one. Um, you know, I mean, he did a great job as driving, you know, I mean, the car, Cars were forming well. We just missed it a little bit. They stepped way up on there, yeah. you know, so credit to them. Uh, the kid he, was dynamite on the tree. He hadn't made it down the track in qualifying really with, yeah. with a successful run. And knowing that, I hate to say, I think we might have gone on defense. And yeah. You can't, you got to stay on offense. We, we it did maybe needed to get more aggressive and didn't. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, I knew I get to the finish line and not that I was looking, but I didn't see my wind light. But as I see him go by with me with his parachutes out of that, ah, oh, I think he got me, you know. But, you know, it is yeah. what it is. He, we had the second quickest run of the session of all the cars. Oh, just got beat by the, the by the quickest session, run. By the quickest run, yeah. We would have beat anybody else on yeah, the property. But else. at the end of the day, you know what? I Honestly, I think we exceeded our expectations yeah. coming here. We came here with an untested car. Um, we pulled it out of the box and went 28. We made really good representative runs. The car went straight, which is... <laughs> Oh, he's a positive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, he did his job. You know, the car did his job. We had a couple mechanical issues, you know, but that's kind of par for the course in any of these things. So, um, but yeah, as far as coming out and doing what we thought we wanted to do, and we managed that. So, I mean, the, it, we're not rolling out of here bummed out too much. Oh. Obviously, you want to go rounds. You yeah. want to win races. But when you have an untested vehicle, you just got to gotta stand on the gas yeah. and see what the hell it's going to do. And, and, it, and, it, and it performed really, really well. The, you know, hats off to the guys at MLR. They really nailed it with this car. Oh, beautiful it, car. It's beautiful dynamite. Job. Yeah. It, it, really nice. Yeah. Really, really nice. Thank you, Richie Crampton. Yeah, thank you, Richie. <laughs> and all the guys at MLR. Thank Absolutely, you guys. Absolutely, yeah. So, no. All right. Cool. Good job. <laughs> One of the coolest things about walking around the top alcohol pits is watching a top alcohol funny car go through their warm-up procedure. Right. This weekend, the Gordon team gave one of their sponsors, Tom Bogner, the motorsports manager for Lucas Oil Products, the opportunity to not only sit in their car, but completely man the controls during the warm-up procedure. After a brief orientation, the team put the starter on the car and fired the 3,500 horsepower beast up. The warm-up serves several functions for top alcohol teams, namely putting heat in the engine and allowing the team to check the functions on several of the systems on the car including shifting through the gears, forward and reverse, and making sure all the timing and fuel system controls are working properly. At the end of the warm-up, the driver brings the car up to stage RPM, making sure that the air gap is set right and the brakes hold at that RPM. Getting ready to get ready for first round of eliminations today, Saturday. Um, we got a good car still. Today's going to be the one of the only runs we got in the in the heat of the day. We're probably going to be running close to lunchtime, so we're going to be maybe up in the top 90s of track temperature, which is the hottest we've seen so far. We think so. We're just going to try to stick with our tune-up. We think that we think we're. Um, on the soft side of things, even as fast as we're going, we think we're on the soft side of things, and we don't really know this car. We don't know if it's gonna take the same changes as our old car used to do, so we're gonna stick with what we got going. If we can get by this round, 
then we'll start testing some changes because we will get a buy for the next round if we can get by this round. So, but at this point, we're going to try to stick with the same program. And if we can run at mid 40, we think we got a good shot. And when I say track temperature, track temperature for us, you know, what we kind of feel is about optimum temperature is probably going to be around 80 degrees. So as the track gets warmer, the the rubber will actually get a little what we call gooey or not as not as tight. So when it's 80, we feel like it's about as best as it could be. If it gets below 80, we feel like the rubber starts to get too hard and it actually won't want to grab the tires so well. At about 80 is the right temperature for it to grab the tires best as we feel it could be. As it gets warmer, 90, 100, you know, that kind of stuff are still good temperatures where it'll still want to grab the track, the tire, but it won't slide it on the track. Once it gets up into the 120, 130, then the rubber just starts getting oily. We call it greasy and it just doesn't want to grab the, to the tire as well. And that way we, we have to start backing down, uh, you know, power levels or clutch or transmission or timing. There's all kinds of different ways we can change it, but we really try to modify it so that we can make it stick to the track better. Let's go, Doug Gordon. All right, guys. Doug Gordon's first round opponent will be Hannes Wernhardt. Doug gets ready to make his run. We'll sit back and let you listen to the sights and sounds riding along in the top alcohol frame. Doug Gordon was able to take the win on that run with a 545 with a zero at 270 miles an hour. Hannes Wernhardt threw it away at the start with a 014 red light and struggled to get down the racetrack. Well, that was another successful run with the Lindbergh car here. Uh, 545, I think we were 700s or somewhere in that area better than any other car that round. We got a consistent car, so this is just a phenomenal feeling. We, uh, we, did, we haven't been making any changes, so, that, so we kind of anticipated a run somewhere, somewhere in that area. But once again, we talked about the track going to be hotter that run, and it was, so we um, had to tune for that. But uh, we're hoping that our tune-up would work for that. Um, but we've had it now twice where the chute has sucked up underneath the car. You know, it is a new car, so we're working out details, but the chute is sucked up went underneath of the car, over the rear end, and then it ended up coming back out from underneath of the car. Now, it didn't break any brake lines or anything like that, so it was able to still get it stopped. But we're doing some more modifications. We've already moved shoot, shoot uh, out on one run. Now we're gonna angle them out so we can get them where they shoot right out in the outside of the, uh, in the outside air coming around the car. That's how we ran our old car. We're gonna try to set it back up like that. You know, we hate testing shoot stuff at Pomona. This is probably the worst track on the series to be having any kind of shoot issues, but um, we feel comfortable with, with this setup. This should get us back in the realm of what we're used to and hopefully get the shoots out on time. But uh, we got going into second round, we're going to probably make some, make some changes and uh, 
we might uh, go for some good runs uh, on the next one. So a lot of times we're going to have a, not a lot of times, but we're going to have a buy run this next round, which is the uh, second round. Um, you know, we got a fast car right now, but we also have a new car that we're not totally comfortable with. We don't really know what a change is going to affect. So this, to, for us, this is a good time to start making some moves. We can start, uh, we're going to try to get more aggressive with it. We think that we have a lot more room in it, even as fast as it is. We think we have more room in it. So we're going to start going to the more aggressive, what we feel more aggressive type of a tune-up and see if it'll run, you know, a low 40 or a high 30 or something like that in good condition. Now, I don't know how late we're going to run, whether or not it'll really start cooling down a lot or if we're still going to be somewhat warm, but it's going to be good. And I'd say we're going to make some moves, see what the car will take. Maybe if we were running, uh, you know, uh, not a brand new car that we're trying to test, you know, maybe we could just try to repeat. But right now, this is a learning time for us. I love that moonshot up there on the big screen right now on that Sunoco Vision. A nice little shot of that great big full moon that is shining up here in the sky in Southern California. Lots of love rolling in on your phone right now, Dennis Taylor. <laughs> yeah, thanks for all the messages out there in the grandstands. Yeah, I know I'm old. I get it. <laughs> try something maybe a little different that they wouldn't normally try in eliminations right now. Well, we're about to find out as the beta motorcycles ride. Rolls up with a solo shot. We're talking about Doug Gordon and the family being from right down here in Southern California. Talked about racers wanting to show off with a home ground. Doug Gordon certainly wants to do the same. And you mentioned that you know, winning the Winter Nationals is a big deal. Trust me, it's a big deal for everyone. Well, winning anyone, any of these races is a big deal. But I'm, the thing that's really cool, if you're really into these cars and you're listening, to see one on a single and to listen to it is quite the treat. Now, this car has been so smooth through low gear all weekend. You can listen to it as he takes this thing down there and. and to the first gear shift point, which is just past that 330 foot block down there. Listen to the engine on this thing. This thing has been singing a song all weekend. That Alan Johnson power plant has just been like an instrument. But we will back out of things and we will let you listen to Doug Gordon's car running on the solo here. Here, as the motor goes through the gears and makes its way down this 1300 and 15 feet. Doug Gordon rolls up against the car free stage. timing out of it so it can get through the troubled area. Whatever they're doing, they've got it figured out. I mean, that's the most consistent car of the last two weeks, and I'm including testing. That thing is incredible. Great job, Gordons. That was a magical moment. Doug, magical moment as Doug Gordon puts up a 545. That'll give him lane choice over Terry Ruckman on one side of the semifinals. PSI Superchargers. Mind-blowing performance since 1988. Manufacturer of championship winning screw and root superchargers. Also components like mag drives, burst panels, and studs. Find out more at PSISuperchargers.com. Final eliminations would conclude the event on Sunday. However, with the chance of rain Sunday afternoon, NHRA made the decision to move eliminations up one hour from originally scheduled. That would put the semifinals right around noon. Here on Sunday, Winter Nationals ready to go for uh, E3 against uh, Terry Ruckman. He's going to be tough competition. I know he's good on the tree. I kind of say he's about a 28 to a 32 guy, and I was looking at his reaction times in E1 and E2. I think he was 32 and 33. So that part of it's going to be, he's going to be tough to beat. I mean, reaction time wise, if we can stay close with him there, then, you know, we should be good. Uh, we're going to probably leave the car very similar. Last night, conditions got pretty cool by the time we got to run. It was, it got dark. Actually got a little bit nervous because last time I raced in the dark was uh, at Vegas when it started cooling down and I got it out of, out, of, out of control and crashed. So I was like, don't do anything stupid here, Doug. You're on a bye run, just get it down the track. And 
So short shifted the gears a little bit. I don't think it really made much of a difference, but uh, may have maybe ran a lower 45 than a 45.9. But we're going to try to run um, somewhere in the same type of run again. Uh, conditions this morning, we got wet conditions possibly, but the way air is definitely a little bit wetter, but it's cooler air. So I think we're going to be similar in power and uh, similar in track. So we're just going to keep, if we could just keep running mid, mid to low 40s, we're going to stick it there and see, see how our day ends up. And talking about short shifting, what I call short shifting is shifting the RPM, shifting that RPM less than the, than the range that we want to shift at. So in this car, we want to shift at around 10 to 10 3 in that range, 10,300 RPM in that range as far as where we shift it. Well, on that run, I shifted like 9,900. Depending on how much clutch we have on the car, if we shift a little bit lower, it can basically try to start sliding the clutch more into gears because it just puts more wear on it when it comes down on the RPM. So we, if we shift it up higher, it relieves the clutch load some more. If we got enough counterweight on it, then we can shift 99 and it doesn't really affect things. So in this, in this case, it was probably didn't really affect too much. In different racetracks, it'll affect more. But in this case, I think it, it maybe I'd like say a couple thousand, but probably not much of anything. And he's going to face one of these two killer cars right here. This is going to be a great drag race. Speaking of racers that are on a mission, Doug Gordon, left side of the racetrack. We have spoken with Doug several times over the course of the weekend, participated in our first ever Get to Know segment. The cabinet maker from Paso Robles, California, brand new pipe built by Johnny Lindbergh. It was a car in process. Uh, the previous car, though, Doug told us flat out in Vegas had a problem. Going up against the Ruckman brothers who are having a problem getting the body down. Dennis looked like they got a little heart attack moment right there, but they're all right now. That's Doug Gordon. Here comes Terry Ruckman. Luckily, all that was is these funny car bodies are a little flimsy. And when you go to let them down, if you don't let them down exactly square, sometimes the little saddles that sit on the chassis don't sit where they're supposed to sit. That's exactly what Tim Ruckman was looking at there. So the Ruckman brothers at a Grand Junction, Colorado, speaking of strong and solid teams, come in as the number seven qualifiers and uh, are able to fight their way to the semifinal round, taking down Ulf Leanders and Brian Howe in the first round. Brian with a very strong car, tuned by Johnny Lindbergh. Doug Gordon with that well-publicized crash out in Vegas. You can find it on Facebook, certainly NHRA's YouTube page. Hurt his ego a little bit. They were bummed out, but coming into this season with renewed focus, brand new chassis, they would love to make a statement. Number one qualifier, a shot at the final. Well, you know, and I got to be honest with you. You know, when Mike Gordon told me he was having Johnny Lindbergh build him his first race car, I looked at him like, are you nuts? Well, I'm telling you what, he looks like a genius right now. Don't mess with the Johnny. Lindbergh, of course, one of the greats. Two-time back-to-back top alcohol champ. Got big show experience, but when it comes to tuning an alcohol car, he is fantastic building a chassis. Obviously, he's pretty good at that as well. Here we go. Who wants that final round out? Oh, Ruckman Brothers up in smoke, and Doug Gordon is going to have a shot at the Wally. It's a 545-5269. That machine beta motorcycles on board for the very first time. They have been on rails all weekend long. That car has not been out of the 540s all weekend. Impressive is not a big enough word for what that team, that car, and Johnny Lindbergh has done. That thing is incredible. Every win is important and significant in the National Hot Rod Association, but whoever wins Top Alcohol Funny Car here at the 60th Lucas Oil Winter Nationals, it's going to be an emotional occurrence. Aaron Roshan, Doug Gordon, both with a shot. Can't wait for the final. That was another good run, another 45 in, uh, in E3, and uh, enough to get by Ruckman, which I knew was going to be tough. I knew he was going to be good on the lights, and I didn't have a great light. Uh, so after that round, I just went up and started watching the tree a little bit more, coming up for the finals. Uh, try and cut a good light against Aaron. I know he, he can cut a good light. I saw in uh, E2 he had a good one. I don't know what he had there, but he's, uh, he's capable. And he's got a good running car, too. So, But we've got a good running car. We just got to keep it going. We're just going to keep trying to do the same, same thing. Hope for no rain. We can keep these conditions going, hopefully. Um, but just keep, keep it up if we can. With the car locked on the 540s all weekend, it was business as usual for the Gordon team getting ready for the finals.
I'll call Funny Cars getting ready to fire up. The question here, can anybody outrun the red car? That is, certainly, that is certainly the big question right now. I mean, Doug Gordon has had this thing on a rail. We talk about from time to time a little tongue-in-cheek about it being a bracket car and being able to dial it in. And I think as Dennis Taylor joins us up here in the booth one more time, that's not really a joke this year. I mean, the way that they've gone so far, they could put a 543, 544, 545 and probably run it if they wanted to. Well, it's, that thing has been so deadly consistent. It's been a long time since we've seen an alcohol funny car this consistent at an event. Well, and I did get a chance to catch up with Aaron Rashawn up at the top end of the racetrack after that semifinal round. Asked him a little bit about the trip out here and uh, if he wants to come out and race on the West Coast a little bit more. He said, I would. The drive's a little long. He goes, to tell you the truth, we actually came out here just to do a little bit of testing to get warmed up before the Gator Nationals and decided that, hey, we might as well stick around here and race. Uh, so far, that's proven to be a really good decision. Well, you know, when you get a career best, which is always good, and you go to the final round, you know, your first final round at a national event, yeah, good choice, Aaron. You know, you could just kind of park the rig out here. They've got these airplanes that you could fly in here and do a little more racing. Well, you could certainly do that. That's uh, that's for sure. He might like to stay on the West Coast and uh, not race those East Coast bad boys. He may like to. So it's Aaron Rashan, as we mentioned, all the way out of Dade City, Florida, here on the right side, had a buy run into the final round. So those guys have had a little extra time to get back there, get things figured out. And Doug Gordon in that brand new Beta Motorcycle sponsored ride. And that very first, we talked about it, Johnny Lindbergh chassis, that thing is paying off big time for Doug Gordon and the team. We'll see if they can cash it into a trophy or if Aaron Rashan is gonna have himself a seatmate on that long drive back to Florida in the form of a little something called a Wally. The little, the little gold Wally. So Aaron Rashawn, first one to find the pre-stage bulbs. Doug Gordon's in as well. Drivers talk to each other with the throttle. <laughs> Doug Gordon's car gives up and Aaron Rashawn is going home with the Wally. 575 at 214 miles an hour. Look at the celebration down there. They're dancing on de now down to the concrete. <laughs> wow. Wow. I would not have seen that one coming. And Dennis, especially even after some of the early numbers, watch this one more time on the instant replay. Doug Gordon's early numbers were there. At the 330, he was out front. Aaron Rashan gives it a ride. And look at Aaron Rashan bouncing over there on the side. By that time, Doug Gordon's car had been silent. And Dennis, we're still kind of picking the jaw up off the, off the table up here. Well, I'll tell you what, I got to put a Band-Aid on my jaw. Oh, my gosh, what a final round. 052 for Doug Gordon, 051 for Aaron Rashan. They left as one. Doug's car was making it down through there like we've seen every run this weekend. 247 to the 330, and hey, Aaron Rashan, 249. That's his quickest to 330 at that point. Aaron Rashan probably couldn't believe he didn't see that red car drive by. Oh, my goodness, look but at I'll him. I'll tell you what. That's why we run him on, uh, we don't run him on paper. Aaron Rashawn, congratulations. Picks up his first Wally at the Winter Nationals. Wow, you can see Aaron Rashawn up there on the Sunoco Vision popping out of the car. Uh, it's obvious at this point in time, even without being, to see, being able to see the rest of his face, that there is a smile about a mile wide on that young man's face. Wow. Wow, what a race. Obviously, something gave up on the Gordon car. That thing was trucking right down through there and you saw the pipes go wet before you saw the throttle close on the replay. Really tough break, but I'll tell you what, Gordon's and Johnny Lindbergh have nothing to put their head down about. No, not at all. There you can see him up there with Amanda Busick. They're gonna get that interview in for the Fox Sportsman Show that'll be coming up a little bit later on. We've
Well, we ended up with the Gordon final round jinx again. Um, congratulations, Aaron Roshan. That was a big deal for him to drive all the way from Florida to get out here. But uh, we had a great car, obviously, all weekend. Um, we ended up shifting it into second gear. We shifted it into second gear. Something broke inside the transmission. Uh, it obviously came apart, uh, came through the case, but the Dennis Taylor blanket uh, kept it all inside and uh, I didn't get hurt or anything like that, nothing damaged there, but zinged the motor and hurt a transmission and lost eight final rounds in a row now. But the um, good thing is we got a good car. We got a good car, we're gonna go to Gainesville with a good car and um, you know we got a, you know, a shot of competing with anybody, but um, super frustrating you know, to, not, uh, to come up with another loss in the final round again. But uh, thank you Will, Anna, and uh, Inside Top Alcohol, and. Um, Top Alcoholic for doing this whole show on us, and uh, we'll be back again. I would like to thank the NHRA broadcast and marketing team for providing us with the on-track footage. I'd also like to thank the Madden Racing team and the Gordon family team for allowing us to follow them through the weekend at Pomona. Stay tuned for our next episode coming at you from the Amelie Oil Gator Nationals in Gainesville, coming out sometime in April.